as we reviewed last week, we always begin by doing our best to place ourselves into the presence of our Lord through the intercession of Our Lady, through our angels, and through our patron saints. In order to do the best we can to stay in that mode of tranquility, we must all do our best to take this seriously. Remember Lent is a time of seriousness, realizing that we need purification and the time for reflection on our lives. We need repentance. So now, after a little more than a week as we pray, reflect on your own Lenten fasting and sacrifices. Reflect on how they've gone so far. And to remember that even if you've been lacking in that, it's never too late during Lent to recommit. It's very important because Lent is a journey. And so even for myself, there have been times during Lenten time where you're working, 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 and you get to the end of Lent, and it's really not to the end to where you're seeing a lot of that fruit. So it's very important to recommit as you need to. And it's an important lesson in this, in this reflecting uh, each day, each week, as we go along in Lent, because you take that with you after Lent is done in your regular prayer life, when, when things become burdened, when there's uh, things that happen in life, you can remember to this, to this working time of Lent, because even though um, we are always should be working, Lent is that very special time where we sit back and we really go to work on something. So even after Lent, <clears throat> as we make it through this mission, you'll take what you learn, the fruits, through the rest of the year, through the rest uh, of your life, of course, working up again to when we come to Lent again. So I ask that once again um, that we refrain from any questions or comments during the conference. Uh, if you wish to comment or ask a question, remember to utilize the email address I provided for you last week, and I have more here for those of you who weren't here if you want to uh, get one from me later. Um, and you can email me whatever question or comment you want, or however you want to put it. And then again, like last week, when I finish, um, I pray that at the end that we remain in silence, in that mode of tranquility, in order to continue to welcome and be open to the graces that our Lord intends for us during this mission. And so I will exit in silence and walk over to the church for the station's Holy Mass and the Holy Rosary. And if you stay and remain in that silence and quiet contemplation, and we, continue, we will continue to invoke the mercy of our Eternal Father by taking part in this mission. As well, um, regarding my own prepared statements, remember that I admittedly stand on the shoulders of great spiritual giants in the history of our church, and I claim nothing for my own and completely rely on those who have gone before me. And so, <clears throat> at your tables I left copies this week of the Chaplet of Ten Virtues, and we'll begin like we did um, last week with the Chaplet. This time, however, um, I will begin the Hail Mary, and then you'll finish. But to remember, as the instructions say, um, at each Hail Mary, you're mentioning a virtue. So when I say the first part, you'll come in with Holy Mary, Mother of God, Most Pure, and then finish, and then we'll continue on. So you just have to remember that virtue. So let us pray by placing all of our intentions into the sweetest heart of our holy and immaculate mother of the divine mercy, that we may all be disposed to the graces of the mission and to take a moment to realize and to look around with our interior eyes and recognize that this building is flowing with the presence of our guardian angels, of those patrons of mine that I have implored to be here and to intercede for us all, the holy archangels, Saint Joseph, blessed Stanislaus of Jesus Mary Papchinsky, Saint Padre Pio, Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, Saint Martin de Porres, and the venerables, Father Casimir Vyshinsky, the Archbishop Fulton Sheen, and Father Solanus Casey, and so many others, but most especially, be aware of the presence of Our Lady and Mother, who always accompanies one of her little sons 
went on mission. As well in our petitions this evening, let's not forget our good Archbishop, Alan Vigneron, who carries such a great and heavy burden, as well as the auxiliary bishops in this archdiocese, but especially for Bishop Donald Hanschen, who presides over this vicariat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Don't forget Our Lady's virtue. Holy Mary, Mother of God, most pure, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In your conception, O Mary, you were immaculate. Let us pray. O God, who by the immaculate conception of the most blessed Virgin prepared a worthy dwelling place for your Son, Grant, we pray, that as you preserved her from every stain by virtue of the death of your Son, which you foresaw, so through her interest, we too may be cleansed and admitted into your presence. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Immaculata Virginis Maria Concepcio, sit nobis salus et protexio. May the sweetest heart of the most blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception and Mother of the Divine Mercy be my salvation, amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to begin with the Holy Scripture passage I chose um, for this conference. Now, those of you who saw the flyer, um, 
I did it for, uh, for brevity's sake because you only saw one verse. But I think it's important as always when we're citing Holy Scripture to look at the verses that precede it and also at the verses that follow it in order to get the proper meaning. But I've, I just want to read these, um, these three verses from, uh, from St. James. Let no man, when he is tempted, say that he is tempted by God. For God is not a tempter of evils, and he tempteth no man. But every man is tempted by his own concupiscence, being drawn away and allured. That's when concupiscence hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. But sin, when it is completed, begetteth death. Now, I chose this verse because it speaks to the root of temptation and often to the results brought on by failing uh, or falling to temptation, the result of that sin. Yet these passages also speak uh, to the depths of the sinful act and not just the temptation to whatever it was that caused our fall, but to the assignment of that temptation as well. Now, why is this important on our on our reflection on death. Because while it is important to reflect on death as a last thing, it's also uh, important to reflect on death as the dying to self. That should be necessary, uh, should be a necessary component of someone who is serious about their own spiritual life and the desire to be united to God so as to enter into a holy death when that time comes. So in order to understand death and its consequences more precisely, we must reflect first on the occasion, uh, when, for the first occasion of sin in mankind by our first parents, Adam and Eve. God created them in glory with, with every preternatural gift. And of the preternatural gifts, there are three. The first one, infused knowledge the gift of natural and supernatural knowledge from God. The second one, the absence of concupiscence. And the concupiscence, which means their nature was, with the absence of concupiscence meant that their nature was properly ordered to God without any propensity to sin or to be burdened by the disorderly passions of the will, namely our pride, desire, and envy. And then the third gift, body immortality. The freedom from bodily death and the separation of the body from the soul. Now, it seems that one would think that being created with these gifts, how was it that they sinned? How was it that they fell? And the answer is found within the natural gift of free will. Being tested as to her fidelity, Eve, freely and voluntarily engaged the serpent and, her allowed, and allowed herself to take her view away from the proper focus on God and even just for that moment focused on herself and what she would gain, that, that secret knowledge in Greek gnosis, that secret knowledge of what the serpent said she would get. And that, that by eating that forbidden fruit, somehow that was to happen. Her fidelity, her faithfulness was compromised. And in that instant, she betrayed God, the result of sin. In that instant, when she chose to listen to the serpent or the devil, Eve conceived of original sin by listening and entering into a conversation with the serpent. Adam, as well, being tested by this promise of secret knowledge, as he listened to his wife and willingly ate of the same forbidden fruit, was unfaithful to God as well and sinned. The moment he engaged the idea to entertain what his wife was presenting to him, which culminated in the bite of the apple. The preternatural gifts did not preempt their sin, but was overcome by the power of free will which is why, despite our own desire and intent to not sin, our free will, which is disordered unto concupiscence, uh, that inordinate and disordered desire for pleasure of the flesh, 
of the world and of my own will, as opposed to that of God. Adam and Eve fell in all three areas and, in effect, lost those preternatural gifts. They were now naked before God. The glory with which they were created was darkened by their sin. There was, so to speak, the opportunity for each of them to die to themselves rather than engage and entertain the temptation to sin by and through the power of their own free will. And imagine yourself at a moment of temptation. And I'm certain that you're able to identify the steps and realize, and it's usually after the fact that we realize, where you lost control. It's at these moments when, by our own perseverance, and through the graces provided to each of us at these moments, that we're supposed to die to ourselves, rather than fall into the smallest of sins. This is the path to sainthood that most of us, most of the time, abandon or betray. So um, think of concupiscence uh, in the sense of a brand new car. So the first time, and that brand new car is perfect most of the time. If, but the first time that the car is hit or drops into a pothole and loses its alignment, it's never the same. Anyone having driven a car that's in need of, that's in need of alignment knows that you cannot lose control of the wheel or the car has a propensity to veer to one side or the other. Uh, the driver has to constantly work to keep the car straight. This is very much like concupiscence. Yet like the car can be taken in to get realigned, so can the soul of the sinner be taken into the shop to be fixed, which is the confessional, the tribunal of God's mercy. However, like the car, although repaired, the car at that point always has a propensity to need to be realigned several times over again, and so too our soul. And this is concupiscence. This is almost never easy and requires the constant difficulty of death, of dying to self, of recognizing the need for penance, for penance and mortification, especially during the time of the church's great realignment, which is this holy season of Lent. St. Alphonsus de Liguri, the doctor of moral theology, wrote, The way to heaven is straight and narrow. They who wish to arrive at that place of bliss by walking in the paths of pleasure shall be disappointed, and therefore few reach it, because few are willing to use violence to themselves in resisting temptations. And this is probably the great fight that we go through most of the time is that we end up giving in to our temptation. Whatever that is, as small as it is, if you desire to be a saint, even the smallest sin will keep you from growing in virtue and holiness, especially the further along you get. And so like driving that car, if you've ever driven a car that needs alignment, you have to hold on to the wheel. And not just hold on to the wheel, but stay focused on where you're going. Because if you do you take your eyes off or you let your hand off the wheel, you're going to veer. And in, in our concupiscence, that's what happens most of the time. Now, thanks be to God for uh, the sacrament of uh, a confession so we can go and get realigned. But that's the battle every day. And so it is a battle. We can't forget that um, because it's a battle, we can't quit. We've got to keep going. The ordinary means for our own testing and working out our salvation is by temptation which provides each of us the opportunity, sometimes constant opportunity, to die to self by having an open heart to receive the prevenient graces God is constantly giving us. And these prevenient graces are those good thoughts and impulses that come before we consent to an act, and most especially before we consent to a sinful act. And we've all experienced this during some kind of deliberation, I can use myself as an example. If I'm being tempted in whatever way, and especially in those things which I'm weakest in, all of a sudden I'll see an image, a holy image, 
or I'll remember something, uh, a passage of scripture, or I'll think of my guardian angel, something like that, or you'll stub your toe, or things like that. Those are those prevenient graces that our Lord is giving to us to help us make the right decision. Unlike our first parents, we don't have the preternatural gifts which kept them in complete harmony with God until they each listened and entertained the temptation voluntarily by and through the power of their own free will. Most of the time, for those who are, go who are doing the best to live out our Catholic faith, life can be one struggle after another, and temptation plays a big part in this. Remember, our Lord allowed himself to be tempted by the devil. He did this not because there was a need for testing, but he allowed it in order to unite himself completely to his own creation, the fallen nature of creation, by correcting all that was lost through Adam and Eve. He is God and he cannot sin, but he could allow himself as a human person to be tested and tempted because it was precisely his will to do so. This temptation, unlike sinful mankind, because Christ has no temptation from within, as we do, it comes from without, only from outside of himself. And Christ is impelled by the will of his Father into this period of testing, again, not for his sake, but for our sake, because while all mankind has been condemned, it is he who is the judge himself who rightly condemns us for our sins. But then, in the same instant, in his great mercy, at that moment he pronounces the sentence of death, the loss of the preternatural gifts, uh, complete harmony with God and his will. The moment that he pronounces that sentence, he leaves the judgment seat, approaches us who are condemned, then with great tenderness and love says, I will take the judgment in your place. I will be condemned and die for you. And this is for each and every one of us. We must always keep in mind, especially during great times of trial and temptation, in the face and of dying to ourself, that our Lord accepted this condemnation and this death for you individually and for me. Not so much as mankind as a whole, even though that's true, but for each individual. This is how great his love and mercy extends in its ominous mystery. Each of us get individually the fullness of his redemptive act if we but continue to resist and constantly die to self for his sake. In the face of this great act of love and mercy to his created, who could resist embracing our daily crosses and temptations of dying to self in order to be, to be completely and wholly united to him when we die? As was said by one of the spiritual patrons of the new men's religious community that we aspire to begin here at the grotto, Saint Gabriel of the Sorrowful Mother, who we commemorate today. He wrote, I want to break my own will into pieces. I want to do God's holy will, not my own. May the most adorable, most lovable, most perfect will of God always be done. So after whatever lifetime the Lord in his infinite majesty deems for us, each of us will find ourselves at the point of death. After all this struggle, the sufferings, and hopefully the dying to self, when that, the immortal soul separates itself from the corruptible body. That's what we're talking about with death. Now, it's remarkable that we all know that someday we're going to die. For most of us, it's from the time that we were very young that we begin to understand the meaning of death. Yet, when we are born, 
there is the whole mystery of life that's before us. Parents wonder of what their child might become, and there is a great mystery as to what life will bring. But it wasn't that way for our Lord. He's the only one born into humanity that was born to die. We're not born to die. We're born to live. Not the so-called Buddha or Muhammad or any other so-called anointed or prophet were born to die. Only Jesus Christ, for he came into the world as flesh in order to die for the sins of all mankind. But yet, in everything we read, that we watch, that we see, that we hear, our society always seems to want more and expects more. Uh, you see, do this and live longer. Eat this and live longer. Practice this and live longer. Do this to live better. And can, can anyone blame us? Yet that is, why is it that we want this? Is it natural simply want to want to prolong life? We enjoy beauty and love. We want to prolong these feelings as long as possible. It can be so gratifying that the desire to prolong our lives actually becomes painful. We don't want to leave. And that which makes us so happy, we want to keep. Wealth, family, friends, home. Seemingly bringing us all kinds of happiness, and we want to hold on to it. And this desire is limitless because our souls are limitless. These desires for love and beauty truly rest in the soul. But many times, most of the time, we focus on the flesh. It does not mean that to enjoy these things that life has to offer is at all disordered. But it does mean that we must constantly reflect on how we use these gifts and if ever they keep us from taking our gaze off our final end, which is God, then we know we've lost at least some control. And we can't fall into the trap of, even in religious life, what I've heard this idea of, well, I'm rewarding myself. I've done so much. I mean, there's something to, again, enjoying the things that God has provided for us in our life. But there should always be the um, ch constant uh, uh, reflecting on what you're doing and why. And whether or not it's taking you away from our final end. Always looking as to God and what you're doing. Body and soul are what make up each human being. And one or the other can be master. And this choice is very serious. It makes life very serious. There's no point in life in which we don't say yes or no to a particular choice. There's no, we always end up making a decision. There will come a time when this trial will be over. No one wants to face the fact of the end. Even the modern mind feels awkward in the face of death. You might ask questions. You wonder, how do I sympathize? What, what do I say? How do I comfort? And why is this? Because we always focus on the circumstances surrounding death. What happened? Was he sick? Was it expected? We almost never focus on the consequences of death, saved or lost, rather than what happened, as if we didn't expect it. We all know that death comes, but when it does, we are perplexed. Saved or lost? This should be our focus. And the idea is not to judge. The idea is not to be there at the rosary or the funeral and ask the questions, well, I know he did this, 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 and this, and this, so he's probably lost. That's not the idea. The idea is, to, again, to reflect on your own life and to approach some, even someone else's death with the knowledge that's going to be you. Where are you in, 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 in your spiritual life? How, are, how do you approach God? Where are those things that you can improve? 
That's what we, we, when we're talking about saved or lost, am I saved or am I lost? And remember, in, our, in, in Catholic spirituality, we are never saved until we are in the bosom of the Father. So we have to keep working on it. Even for those who die, we can't assume that they went to heaven. Unless, which this would be an extraordinary gift, unless you've been given the grace by God to know that that person is in heaven, we don't know. And so that's what we constantly pray. One another, pay, another spiritual founder of the new community, St. Padre Pio, would teach that when someone dies, our Lord takes into account all the masses that are going to be said, all the prayers that are going to be done, all the candles that are going to be lit, all of those things, and allows them into heaven based upon all that's going to be done. So when someone dies, especially someone of our family, someone we love, when you get that inspiration to do something, mass, candle, pray, do it. We owe it. It's part of what we owe. It could be that someone is in heaven based upon what we're already supposed to do. Very important to remember when we're talking about death. Death is purely natural and biological for everyone, even for animals, but there's a big difference. The death of a man is not the same as the death of an animal, even though you may read some things like this on the internet. For animals, it's like a circle. There's a beginning and there's an end, and that's it. For, human, for man, it's not. In fact, for us, the true beginning is at our death, that we're making our way back to God, that we, this is what gives us strength in our journey. And even when, if, if we get sick, and even if we have time, this is what gives us the, the strength to get through, or at least it should. It doesn't mean that the temptations or the tests don't get even that much more, because some of the great saints, and I'm thinking of uh, another spiritual patron of the community, St. Teresa of Lisieux, her own death was very difficult. And she, wrote, she would write how she could see how someone would want to commit suicide because she felt she couldn't feel the presence of God. She would write um, how she, she could understand why someone was an atheist. But she didn't turn away from her faith. She had that much more faith, even though she couldn't feel it. And she would say that God was giving her that so she could pray and sacrifice for those who were struggling with taking their own life, who were atheists. So it's very important that in the spiritual life to know that all these testings and temptations are for the end. They're going to have an immediate effect in what's going on, but they're always looking towards the end because our Lord, desire, when you die, when I die, when that last breath escapes us and our soul separates from our body, our Lord desires us with him completely and fully in heaven. Don't fall for that trick of saying, oh Lord, just give me purgatory, because then I can work it out there. Because what if you miss? In sports, you know, when we would uh, train, you never, you never wanted to be second place. You trained to win. This is from St. Paul. You don't train to make second or third place. What if you miss? You might not make it at all. So we have to think of life in the same way. For, for humankind, for man, it's like a trajectory that reaches beyond time. But for us, there is somehow one who comes out to reach for us and to snatch him to himself. The penalty of original sin, as we just reviewed, is death. Death handed down by one man. And it is because of this that we die. Death is not how God planned it for us. If there was no sin, there would be no death. I think of the example of Our Lady. Because like her son, she was fully human and she had to pass through death. But as the Immaculate Conception, death for her was not the result of original sin, a painful occurrence that we call that another uh, patron of the community, St. John Paul II, when he was shot, he talked about realizing the throes of death. And that's what we call those last moments, the very difficult time, when he himself, St. John Paul, said he knew that the devil was there 
telling our Lord why he shouldn't take him into heaven. So these throes of death, but, an, but becomes a natu- is a natu- the death of Our Lady is simply a natural occurrence because she's human. The supernatural reality for her came just after death when she, by love himself, was taken up into heaven, reuniting her immaculate body with her immaculate soul. Our Lord also died and rose, but of his own choosing and of his own power. The example of Our Lady is the promise he makes to all of us by taking upon himself the condemnation and death incurred for our own sin. The immaculate conception of Our Lady points directly to the assumption. And she is the light and the mirror of all that is love and mercy. She is the promise and life as God intended. And if you remember, as I was talking about how Eve listened, how Adam listened, how Eve conceived original sin by listening. And I didn't make this up. This is St. Ephraim. Our Lady conceived our Lord through the ear. The moment she heard the archangel Gabriel tell her this, what was going to happen, she accepted. She conceived of our Lord at that moment. And she conceived through the ear. The same way that all was lost by Eve through the ear, the mother of death, Our, our Lady, conceiving by the ear, becomes the mother of life. And so we can, knowing that and trying to embrace that, this is why we can never speak enough about her and can say in union with Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, De Marie num quam satis, can never say enough of our, about Our Lady. And he'll go on to say that if you read Holy Scripture, if you look close enough, you'll find Our Lady on every page. Most of us die daily. In the daily sufferings of life, the family trying to make it from paycheck to paycheck, the person who's been looking for a job, the student struggling in her own studies, the grandmother lamenting the loss of faith in her children, the ones left behind after the death of a loved one, and the countless other dyings every day in these sufferings. And when death does come, if we've done our best to unite our sufferings to those of our Lord, then our death becomes a masterpiece. But it doesn't happen within a day. The perfect death is a culmination of all that was suffered daily, in the dying to self, as we first reviewed. We fear death because we're not prepared for it. Most of us die only once, but we should be dying daily to the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is so filled with the filth of our own perversions and desires that modernity shouts back to us that it's all quite normal. We begin to believe that just because certain practices or ways of life have become commonly accepted by the secular world, then the church needs to get with the times and change. No wonder people are leaving in droves. No wonder there are so few men who want to become priests. No wonder the loss of convents and religious. We cannot and we must not allow the world to dictate what our Lord has already taught. The truths remain the same today yesterday and forever. Quite ironically, what this dictation from the world does is simply to conceal that which is vibrantly real, death. And what is ironic is that when death, as repentance, as mortification, as dying to self, as our giving up those things which are sinful, as that death is suppressed in the church, it breaks out in the death of God in the modern world. Once death comes, there's no remedy for our evil life. But before, there's a remedy by dying to ourselves. But if we do not, 
if we continue in our sin, if we continue to test God thinking he's not watching, he doesn't care, if we refuse to take advantage of his tribunal of mercy in the sacrament of confession, and we remain in sin, we know for the wages of sin is death. However, if we turn to his mercy, then as the Apostle Paul continues, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One must be torn from the old man and this die, dying daily to our temptations, those of the world, those of the flesh, those of the devil, then we indeed, through the mercy of God, overcome death and it does not come like a thief in the night. Jesus says to St. Faustina in her diary, I have opened my heart as a living fountain of mercy. Let souls draw life from it. Let them approach the sea of mercy with great trust. Sinners will attain justification and the just will be confirmed in the good. Whoever places his trust in my mercy will be filled with my divine peace at the hour of his death. The passion that we should reflect on with each passing day of Holy Lent, the passion of our Lord, and what we get closer to commemorating is about death, particularly his death. But we cannot truly understand death without understanding love. Love never becomes a cult without death. It is never seen or understood as amazing or something to imitate until death. How often does human love come into full meaning and to a full understanding until the death of a loved one? As history becomes legend after death, so the love we have for those who go before us becomes adoration. One no longer keeps any memory of the other's faults or what was left undone. All is surrounded with this great aura of praise. All the world weariness of life fades away. The quarrels and arguments that hurt us evaporate or else they're transformed into souvenirs of affection. The dead are always more beautiful than the living. All that we see of the sufferings of Christ in his passion is what falls under our own eyes. Calvary is always in our midst. In the eyes of God, Calvary happens all through time. He sees all that we were, all that we are, and all that we will ever be through Calvary. The passion of our Lord, the lessons of death and dying to self, remain in some people continuously, and in others, not so much. Those suffering from any kind of disease or affliction, those who have been physically and emotionally hurt, their suffering is very real. Those who have psychological problems, depression, anxiety, and all those things associated with it, these are very real and valid sufferings, and all these people ache very much in a way that can be associated with the sufferings of our Lord. You see, for those who are suffering, whenever any of us suffer in any way, then we can faithfully do our best to unite our sufferings to those of our Lord on Calvary. And when we constantly die to self, we can truly and honestly say, I am suffering in him, and he is suffering in me. Remember, he's done it all. He's redeemed all of mankind forever and ever. Sins of the past, sins committed now, and sins committed in the future, all of them he has taken upon himself. So when someone asks you why the crucifix, the work has been done, he does not need our help, but he wills our help in the continuing saving act of the redemption purchased for each and every one of us by his most precious blood. This partaking in his continual saving act of redemption that he purchased and that he wills for us to do is why we are all Jesus. You are Jesus. 
I am Jesus, each in our own particular way. And we are called to be Jesus in the world. Did you know that? That's who you are. That's your true identity. You are called to be Jesus to everyone who you meet each and every day of your life. And where did Jesus show the ultimate goodness and love? The unfathomable, unmeasure, unmeasurable love and goodness? On the cross. Through his willingness to empty himself as God and lower himself to become a human, we can do the same by constantly reflecting in prayer and dying to our own self, dying to our own self-will and the natural tendency to satisfy our passions. So just for a moment, let's go back to that day, that first Good Friday, when our Lord was nailed to the cross, condemned for all of our sins. And look there at the cross, there standing our Holy Mother and St. John the Beloved there at the foot, all in utter grief, but at the same time with heartfelt belief in what he had promised. At these moments, there are also people in the temple gathering for the Passover rituals that were to begin that night. Yet there in the temple, they worshiped away from the Holy of Holies, far away from a huge curtain that held behind it the Ark of the Covenant. The Blessed Virgin Mary, the true Ark of the Covenant, and Saint John the Beloved are not far away from the true Holy of Holies hanging on the cross. They are there at his feet. Yet many of the same people who rejected, mocked, and spat at Jesus are there at the temple in front of that curtain that is some 60 feet wide and 30 feet tall, woven with gold and purple, for it was the veil before the Holy of Holies, where once a year the Jewish high priest interceded for the people, taking their sins to the mercy seat of the eternal God that sat atop the Ark of the Covenant, begging for his forgiveness. All these people are there. They all ignore and reject him who is the true Holy of Holies, hanging upon that tree of life just up the hill. And they stand there in front of that curtain in that temple, righteous, smug, before this huge man-made curtain, praying and thanking God they are not like those who believed in that false prophet, in that Jesus. Now, as they're watching, the curtain, the veil, is ripped from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, because any man could have done that, but from the top to the bottom. And for the first time, the Holy of Holies is exposed to the people and they scream. At that very second, the Roman soldier takes a spear and thrusts it into the side and the heart of our Lord hanging dead on that cross, into the curtain of his flesh, piercing the veil, revealing the true holy of holies, blood and water gush forth. Heaven is opened. We are saved. God love you.